riding on a fiery motorbike to avenge the innocent with chains and hellfire. Let's speculate on the science behind Marvel's Ghost Rider. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center. Today we're taking a look at the spirit of vengeance himself, and the speculative physics of this supernatural vigilante. Big thank yous to Jackson Younger for sponsoring this episode. And please consider setting those like and subscribe buttons ablaze if you like this video. And now, without further ado, let's get started. Throughout our research, we've met many organisms that evolved to live beyond the confines of the conditions we often and close-mindedly consider capable of bearing life. But in all cases, these living organisms seemed little more than those on our world, simply adapted to different conditions. That was until the discovery of an entirely different place that seems to defy our understanding of biology. Organisms in this place, or realm as we've started calling it, are constantly producing omega particles, which we've studied before after they were discovered in the archipelago known as the Boiling Isles, with these particles being capable of causing passive decay of matter into the protons, neutrons and electrons that constitute it. Upon studying a living organism in this environment, we discovered the presence of several particle accelerator-like clusters located inside its body, used to store said elemental particles inside an electromagnetic field. If this organism is part of a larger species, or a unique occurrence, we currently do not know. What we do know is that selective use of these particles allows it to move matter by changing its charge, to alter its composition, and to create, reinforce or break bonds between molecules. It is one particular application of this ability that led to us discovering this entity, as it is capable of collapsing matter through neutron bombardment, creating a controlled wormhole, or a rift between two points in space, allowing it to manifest into our realm. What happened is, the entity summoned this rift within a human being, thus creating a physical and mental bond between the two and allowing the entity to use its abilities in our world through its host. This host, who adopted the moniker of Ghost Rider, will have his body entangled with the entity whenever the rift is summoned, thus becoming partially composed of the entity's matter and energy. As a result, the host's body will be enhanced, made stronger and faster through mechanisms we will detail in a moment. The rift will also cause a separation between the host and its surroundings by virtue of being placed in between the two, effectively shielding the rider from any damage directed towards them. The electromagnetic fields of this entity, mentioned earlier, allow it to detect proton fluctuations in its environment, which constitutes its main way to interpret sensory input, allowing it to detect the composition and location of matter around it. It seems, upon first interacting with our bodies, the entity could use these same fields to detect the movement of the protons present in water as it moved towards different parts of our body and, particularly, different parts of our brain following a principle similar to Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or fMRI. In essence, this allows the entity to detect how our brain is being used and, after having learned to interpret these patterns, to decode our thoughts. As you can imagine, the applications of this are incredibly varied, permitting the entity to communicate with the mind of its host, which is how we learned the entity has a name. Saratos. This, however, also allows the entity to read the minds of individuals other than its host, leading to a very fascinating outcome. For reasons currently unknown, the entity seems to have developed quite an interest in human beings. Perhaps its natural curiosity and observations 
as well as constant intrusions into our reality, have led to it forming a certain appreciation for our kind, and an absolute abhorrence to the harming of innocents. When in control, the entity seems to take measures to attack those who cause harm, easy enough thanks to its ability to sense intentions and memories. And these same abilities will allow it to alter its victim's mind, removing their desire to do harm, or even inflicting pain based on the target's own memories of the people they've harmed. Something the entity's host has told us is dramatically named the Penance Stare. One of the most immediately visible results of the bonding between the entity and its rider is the generation of huge amounts of heat and fire. You literally cannot miss it. This is a result of applied use of the stores of subatomic particles held by the entity, which can be shut out and made to clash with slower particles present in the environment, and this clash produces large amounts of heat. The heat can easily ignite the air molecules present in our atmosphere, producing what the rider has referred to as Hellfire. This Hellfire constitutes the entity's main offensive tool, although the extent of its effectiveness within its own, so to speak, ecosystem, has yet to be fully studied. While the Hellfire produced has a great potential for harming other entities by itself, Electron charging of the particles will allow the entity to selectively repel or attract said particles through its own electromagnetic fields, effectively allowing them to be manipulated at a distance, allowing the rider to use this hellfire as a long-range weapon or to absorb other fire into themselves. Hellfire is as damaging to physical objects as regular fire is and our tests have found no difference between them despite the rider's insistence. However, through the application of a repelling vacuum on top of any physical object, the entity can imbue hellfire into any body without the two being in direct contact, therefore preventing damage to said object. This is most noticeable in the clothes and vehicle of the rider. Interestingly, it seems the mental link established between the entity and the rider can have subtle effects on the rift's heat output, with the intensity and even coloration of the fire produced being altered by the mental and emotional state of the host. Now, let's return for a bit to Saratos itself. Due to the way its functioning requires the creation and maintaining of electromagnetic fields within itself, this entity holds a variety of metal particles forming part of its mass. Applied neutron discharges will allow Saratos to alter the composition of these particles, causing them to either aggregate and fuse together or separate from each other, and the aggregation of different amounts of specific particles can allow Saratos to alter the qualities of its electromagnetic fields, allowing them to move and interact with their surroundings in different ways. However, once bonded to a rider, this same ability can be used to fuse metallic particles into physical objects, including spikes, chains and other weapons the rider can use as a means of protection or to give themselves an offensive edge. While these objects can be formed independently, Particle aggregation will usually be performed on pre-existing objects, such as clothes, weapons or vehicles, thus altering their appearance and slightly improving their functionality while the rift is active. Improved functionality, at least in terms of combat and dealing damage. Through a combination of its parokinetic and matter manipulation abilities, the offensive potential of the rider is almost limitless. This same aggregation of matter also allows the entity to regenerate matter to a certain degree, reverting damage suffered during its activities. However, due to the complexity of most matter, this is only possible to a useful degree in objects with a simpler composition, such as objects made of metal alone, or on objects the entity is intimately familiar with, such as its host, as well as objects commonly used by them. Another fascinating application of this is the bonding of vehicles to the rider, 
which is done by controlling the molecules that make up a vehicle's composition, which allows the rider and the entity to not only have a greater control over said vehicle, but to even control it remotely. This same principle can also be applied to living means of transport, animals such as horses and, according to some recent findings, mammoths. In this case, the bonding is made through a mental interface similar to that between the rider and the entity. A bonded transport can be controlled or altered to a more advanced degree by the entity, which seems to greatly prefer using the wheels of vehicles to create independent electromagnetic fields, which it may use to induce localized gravitational anomalies like that which forms the rift the entity used to enter our realm. These independent EM fields will allow the vehicles to adhere to any surface, allowing it to move at great speeds independent of the terrain, its composition, and even its inclination or orientation, with evidence of a certain degree of anti-gravity movement being possible. If this may be related to the oft-reported phenomenon of ghost riders in the sky, has yet to be fully proved, but initial research is promising. And that's it for Speculative Biology Look into Ghost Rider. This episode, of course, was a bit of a step outside my comfort zone, since it's much more focused on physics with not an inkling of biology in sight. Luckily, the physics behind the mechanisms seen here had already been worked out previously, like in our Owl House episode, and that is no coincidence. We've only scratched the surface so far, because there's something huge incoming, and both the Titans and the Spirit of Vengeance will be a part of that. And maybe this could also open the road for some other things, like speculative technology, which has been requested often in the channel. The final design and abilities of the Ghost Rider were barely divergent from the original, since this episode worked more as an explanation than a full-on reimagining which can work as a template for other future episodes, especially in regards to human superheroes. Thanks again for commissioning this episode, Jackson. Not many thanks this time, because nobody could have seen this coming, but I hope you enjoyed this episode nonetheless. And also, huge thank you to our researchers and research associates who support us through Patreon and YouTube memberships. Remember, you too can join in if you want to support our channel. And you get some nice perks too, like seeing all of our creatures and videos ahead of time and helping mold them into shape. Or you can also like, subscribe, or write a comment telling me any type of creature you would like me to give the spec evil treatment in the show. Any of those really help the channel a lot. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.